everybody. Welcome to the county seat. Today I'm your host Chad Booth. We are in Carbon County for our program today. And we wanted to take a day to benefit from the wisdom of somebody who's put in three decades of service to the county and has spent basically since the turn of the century dealing with land issues here in, in uh, Carbon County. And it really is a conversation about Carbon, Emory, parts of Wayne County, this whole center section. I guess you'd call it swell country, wouldn't you, Rex? That'd be good term. Yeah, our, re our, our guest today is Rex Sacco. He is, uh, he is stepping down soon as the public lands director for Carbon County, but he's well known all over the state for his efforts in public lands. Uh, what do you see as the, the big issues to be dealt with? I think what we need to do is we need to go back and start looking at, I guess you could say, the consequences of some of the policies mm -hmm. of the past administration and try to fix them. Like, like what, RS-2477? RS-2477 is an issue that's been actually evolving since before I even come in to work as a public lands guy. But mm -hmm. I can tell you RS-2477 itself, I think, could be very easily remedied right through administrative action of the Department of Interior because they're the agency that under the Federal Lands and Policy Management Act has been given the authority to make those decisions. When you talk to people about RS-2477, you talk to the attorneys who are litigating the case, mm -hmm. and they say litigation is the only way to do this. You talk to the BLM, they say, our hands are tied. Uh, we, we have to rely on what the court says. We can't just end this if we want. And you disagree with that? I do. I adamantly disagree with it because the court system works on a controversy. And the federal agencies aren't allowed, or, well, under the Constitution, the judges aren't allowed any authority in the, these deals unless they, it's an Article Three controversy under the Constitution. Okay, that's well, that's well been discussed in RS-2477. There has to be a cause for controversy to file a claim. But I'm saying that the grandfather clause of the Federal Lands and Policy Ani Management Act uh, grandfathered through these roads that was created prior to uh, uh, October 22nd of 1976. So I think that the Secretary of Interior, if he agrees with that, can, can basically administratively fix this. That's not a controversy because the counties and the states are saying, great, let's sit down at the table and let's fix it. So you're saying that, that all of these stipulations and things that you're trying to do in the court could be solved just by making a, 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 a record of decision from the Department of Interior level, from the Secretary level? an administrative decision would probably work. Uh, what is the difference between that and an agreement after mediation? Well, I... I Except the judges and the lawyers aren't involved. And, and the NGOs. Well, even after this happens, mm -hmm. the NGOs might have some ability to do this, but I believe that uh, under existing law right now, that if the, the agency follows the, the law, the mm -hmm. con congressional mandates under FLIPNA, mm -hmm. and they adhere to those, and they create policy based on that, that the, the uh, NGOs or any other agency like that doesn't have any ability for them to change the management that, or the way that is managed by the, the agency because uh, the, the, the Congress has already given that authority to make those decisions to the secretary. It's a one sentence thing to say any roads that that were constructed uh, or in use prior to 1976, the day the act went into place, um, are, are grandfathered in or recognized as RS-2477 yeah, rights of way. It talks about all uses, not just the roads. Mm -hmm. There's a number of other uses that were there, not just the roads. The grandfather clause doesn't just work on roads, it works on other things that were in, in fact, going on prior to that. Really? Uh, yes. So it's, it's broader than just the roads? Yes. If you, if you look at the, the act itself, that's what it says. Okay. RS-2477 basically talks about highways and rights of way on lands not previously reserved. That's true. It does talk about that. So how would the... It doesn't would, say roads. What would the solution look like on those rights of ways? Simply? I think that basically a one-page document with the map, Utah... Uh, Utah's map that we've had put together for probably 20 years now mm -hmm. that be, that uh, the Department of Interior has probably had that long uh, being used as, as a basis for what roads that they can patent over to the, the state and the, the counties with an undivided interest 
would probably solve the problem for everybody. Thanks. Acknowledgement of that those roads are roads that were grandfathered through under RS-2477 and the grandfather clause of the Federal Lands and Policy Management Act. And so then, then what, do the counties have to record that patent at that point? How, 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 does, how do you make a record of it so somebody can prove that it happened? The recorder, the county recorder. Uh, AGRC has a, the ability, they've got a program that they can actually create a centerline survey description of all the roads. In fact, I believe they probably have already on most of the roads in, in this state. So the thing about it is, is we could get that information from the county, uh, from AGRC, the county recorder would receive it and they would basically uh, record those patents because a patent is nothing more in civilian language than a deed. Right. So that's kind of one way to looking at it. Huh. It's a simple fix and it really doesn't involve lawyers do you think there's any chance it'll actually happen? I don't know. I would like to think that in this administration, uh, especially since President Trump and everybody in his administration would like to see an, an ability for the, the states to pursue a lot of energy development and uh, you know uh, other things that we need to do on our public lands that the best way to get out there to explore and develop energy and also most importantly to to be able to get it to market from where they're taking it out of the ground would be that we own those right of way so not only for the roads itself but for uh, utilities for pipelines and everything else it would be the easiest way to do this and basically being able to uh, have these areas open so that uh, the local counties and the state, you know, through their agencies like the Division of Oil, Gas and Mining can uh, do the work on these would streamline the process of getting the infrastructure put together so that we can uh, address the needs great. of this, the American public. This is a great place to take a break. We'll come back and we'll pick up the conversation on energy here on the county seat. We'll be back in just a minute. 149 million years in the making, dinosaurs once roamed this land. Now they're found at the Dinosaur National Monument. Let's take you beyond the bones. We call it Dinosaur Land. You'll find it offers adventures and sights not seen anywhere else in the world. Come to Dinosaur Land, Vernal, Utah. You'll want to stay forever. The dinosaurs did. What would you do with an extra day in Utah Valley? Explore the Wasatch Mountains? Snap a family photo at Bridal Veil vale Falls. Cool off on Utah Lake or the Provo River. No matter what you're searching for, you can find it in Utah Valley. Bring everyone together. The Layton Hills Mall offers more than just shopping. Bring the whole family and enjoy Sequest Interactive Aquarium to feed the fish and exotic birds, hold live reptiles, and even swim with the stingrays. Or pump up the action and visit Dartside, Utah's premier soft foam dart tag arena. And don't forget the Great Room Escape where you can challenge your friends to solving mysteries inside themed rooms. So come and experience great fun at the Layton Hills Mall and visit playindavis.com for other great activities. All local products have a story of magical places, real people, and delicious recipes spanning generations. So go ahead and discover flavors you've never tasted and friends you never knew you had. Utah's own Discover Local Food. Welcome back to the county seat, talking with Rex Sacco, who has been the public lands director down in Carbon County for a while, just talking about some of the issues in swell country. We talked about transportation, RS-2477. It kind of led us into energy. The buzz around is coal. Uh, we have a president who has supposedly ended the war on coal. He's, he's backed off some of the regulations. The environmentalists think that we are now um, uh, on, our, on our way to ruin and that, that our, our air quality is, is in greater jeopardy than it's ever been. What do you see the future for coal? 
seeing as this is such a big coal region? I think there's a big future for, for coal development. Most of the American public aren't aware of the advanced technology that is being used to uh, break down coal and the, the various elements that actually create that product. Uh, there's, I guess I'd have to ask a lot of people, uh, how are you going to melt down steel, make steel with, with gasoline or with gas, even natural gas? The BTUs aren't high enough to make that happen or to do it economically. Coal is the best method and probably one of the only methods to do that. But it doesn't have to be coal right out of the mine burned to do that. This new advanced technology actually creates coke like they used to do in the old days, but what they do is they catch all of the stuff that used to go up in the air mm -hmm. and they make different byproducts out of it. That's what coal degasification is about. But there'd be some people, Rex, that would argue that, that there's no point for that because we aren't manufacturing coal in the United or steel in the United States anymore. I think it was a promise that President Trump made, and I think that it's one of the things that we are very sorely lacking in this country is the ability for our own security to have steel in this country. How does security become a, a steel issue? Well, back during the Second World War, mm -hmm. the town of Dragerton and the steel mill in Provo mm -hmm. was put in. And it was done in less than a year. And it was done in order to make sure that if the Japanese invaded the West Coast, that there would be some steel manufacturers to, to produce airplanes and army tanks inland if they were to take over the West Coast. Now, I don't see that there's a whole lot of things different about especially if there's hardly any steel production at all in the United States now, they need to do that. And if you're taking a look at the competition that we have internationally, uh, as far as creating vehicles and all kinds of other things, if we have to import our steel, they can hold us hostage on the cost of that steel. I think that this is a very good way to create more middle-class American jobs, and I believe that I'm not saying anything different than President Trump said on the campaign trail and even after in some of his speeches when he became president. I think it's, it's a viable thing to do. I think it will create probably hundreds of thousands, if not maybe a million, new jobs because of the direct and indirect effects of making steel in this country. Would we be able to? Would we be able to turn it uh, turn it around and actually get production back up? Is that going to be a hard thing to do? I don't think so. I think that uh, the infrastructure building and President Trump talked a lot about infrastructure building. Mm -hmm. uh, where are we going to get all of the Girders material needed for the bridges to, to, to yeah. build roads and everything? And remember that even during uh, the last administration, Buy America was a big campaign issue for President Obama. The problem with by American during the Obama administration was that he did not have the infrastructure set up that they was producing anything they could buy in this country, but it worked very well to get support from a lot of the union jobs. But the fact of the matter is, is now we have a president that actually wants to produce steel in the United States, and he wants to use coal in the United States that's from the United States. Okay, well, I... I think we've kind of covered that issue and come back and talk about cows for a minute because grazing is also a big issue out here. We'll be back with the county seat. Look south to adventure. Look south to beauty. Look south to San Juan County. Out here, the road goes on forever and what you'll find will change how you see the world. Climb on your OHV and discover forgotten landscapes and vistas that challenge the imagination. From Blanding and Monticello to the cliff faces of Monument Valley, we're open and ready for you to explore. San Juan County, Utah's Canyon Country. There's a little place on a Utah map Where I was raised, where my heart's at Where the sagebrush grows wild and high And the stars come out at night In the basin with the youth reservation, skin starvation, that Duchesne County life. 
What happens when the unstoppable meets the immovable? Find out June 24th at the Juab County Fairgrounds in Nephi as you experience Juab Extreme Racing. Competitors from across the nation converge to put their skill to the limit on one of the most difficult tracks anywhere in the world. These obstacles aren't going anywhere and the racers aren't slowing down. June 24th, the unstoppable meets the immovable at the Juab County Fairgrounds. Juab Extreme Racing 2017. Get tickets at juabextremeracing.com. Welcome back to the county seat, We're talking about issues in swell country today and uh, kind of getting a parting shot from Rex Sacco, who is uh, going to be retiring soon. And I guess you're going to turn yourself out on the range like one of those old Western cowboy songs. <laughs> my, my ultimate idea is to look at life between the ears of a horse. For how long, I don't know, but... <laughs> Let's talk about grazing. Um, you know, most people, when they think of carbon in Emory County, uh, they, they basically think of, of, of coal, they think of energy. That's kind of what your, your signature is out here. How important is grazing to this community? If you look at the resource area, which is basically carbon in Emory County, uh, we contribute about anywhere between 13 to $18 million a year in cattle production. So I think, I think it's, it's uh, something that uh, is you know, we set right about in the middle of the stats uh, for uh, cattle production in, in Utah, which is not bad. We're not a big cattle producing area, but cattle, cattle production and uh, grazing in general, even sheep and cattle both, are very viable. What kind of changes um, need to take place in grazing? Um, I mean, this is another area where they're looking at making some changes and they're looking at reviewing uh, policies and regulations and, and trying to streamline the process at a, at a federal level. Um, how, much, how much negative pressure happens on, on grazing and how much positive pressure could come? Grazing in this area hasn't been picked on a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. When we did our resource management plan, the, the record of decision, we didn't lose any grazing AUMs at all in this, in this resource area. I actually contributed, I wrote uh, the, the planning for grazing soils vegetation for both carbon and emory county's position on this and uh, it worked out pretty well but the, the thing about it is that i see is a big problem and it's an administrative problem that they're trying to do in a different manner and that is a renewal grazing renewals is something under the taylor grazing act that was supposed to be an administrative process if you didn't change the season of use mm -hmm. the type of species that was grazing mm -hmm. and if the land was in stable or increasingly better health that we just needed to be you know those judgments are made because blm does monitoring on a regular basis we do trend monitoring and we do utilization studies right. to, after the animals leave to see to what degree they've utilized the the resource right. so long and the short of it is is right now it's a big deal for our our people in the in the agency down here to try to renew grazing permits. I think one of the big things that needs to happen is we need to get a permanent fix to this. Right now, with the 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 Grazing Improvement Act that was passed in Congress here uh, year before last, mm -hmm. we've got a continuation so they they continue to keep our permits active while they're going ahead and trying to get the the permits completed. But I think that that's a fallacy. I think that what we need to do is li actually let these guys act on it. They've already got the information, and it's administrative act. And why can't they just renew them for ten years? You mean you mean the basically the decision about the range health and and whether to continue a permit has been pulled from the state and has gone to Washington? Is that is that what you're kind of saying? They basically they're, they're saying that we have to do an environmental analysis before they can renew each grazing. Permit. I mean, each individual rancher, that is, each that AUM is, has to have an that environmental is, analysis. That is what a lot of this is, is going on to. And in fact, when you did the, the resource management plan, that is, was part of the, the whole deal was to go out there and to evaluate that. 
Now, when you do the 10-year permit renewals, the information is already there to make the analysis, to make the decision to administratively renew the permits. And that's what I'm saying that, con that needs to continue. Uh, my brothers and I have a permit that borders on wilderness area. And the reason why we have to have an EA done every 10 years that takes an extra six to eight months to reevaluate it is because when they drew the borders, they did it with an older version of GIS. Mm -hmm. So some of the borders overlap. But the reality of it is, is the wilderness study area is up on top of the plateau of a cliff that is four to 500 foot higher than where our grazing allotment is. So the cattle physically can't get there. If they were mountain goats, they could, but they can't get there. And, but you still have to do an EA But because, because the borders, the pencil border, hmm. intersects some of the grazing allotment border, then they have to do an EA on it. And the thing is, is how much does it cost us? At the level, at the federal level, at the local level, even when you're talking about businessmen that are trying to make a living. Wow. So, uh, would there be some value in dynamic grazing? I mean, I mean, do, doing more about looking at conditions on the ground because you've got a set level. If you have like three or four really good years, and, and you, you've got a lot of grass growth, and you've got a lot of feed out there, you've got a lot of fuel. If you're looking at the other way, wouldn't it be better to have a dynamic grazing kind I, of a program? I believe that that's absolutely the truth. I think that there's some things that we can do to make that work, but it has to be where the agency puts a little faith in the local, uh, you know, agencies here, our, like our field offices, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to make those types of determinations and to work with the the grazers, the permittees out there to get that done. Uh, I think what you're talking about would in many cases be a preventative for fires. Because if you let that stuff grow and you don't feed it off, it's gonna be fodder for maybe a fire in the fall. That, you know, that low BTU biomass material can really get some stuff going. We've seen that on the West Desert. We've seen, and what does that cost again? Oh, yeah. And what is the value of it if it's fed through an animal so that the American people can get the value in the store? It seems like this all kind of boils down to issues of, of planning. And so we'll take our last segment and we'll talk about planning here on the county seat. We're having a chat with Rex Zacco. We'll be back in just a minute. There's one more who would go again. I feel myself I'm not enough. There is a place where looking out means looking in, where an impression lasting only a few seconds will be imprinted on a life forever, where courage is forged and innocence rediscovered, where remembering is rewarding and forgetting unforgettable. There is a place where truth is felt and where seeing is believing. There is a place. Farm Bureau began as a collection of farmers supporting each other to raise the food we enjoy. Today, Farm Bureau membership encompasses everyone, whether ranchers, growers, or just everyday folks like you and me. Members enjoy discounts on items like vehicles and ATVs, or insurance that's very affordable. You don't have to be a farmer to join, and dues are small, but together we make a big difference in keeping our food supply local and abundant. Join Utah Farm Bureau. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking today with Rex Sacco down in Carbon County about uh, things in swell country. We've covered quite a few issues, grazing, transportation, energy, planning. I think it needs uh, a, a little bit about planning. 
we've seen some changes at the federal level with the state with the with the rescinding of BLM planning 2.0, which would have, according to BLM, streamlined the process, but it would have allowed a lot more stakeholders into it and a lot more voices uh, complicating the planning. Was that a good move? I think that it was an excellent move to make because the problem was is they were superseding federal law in the way that they was going about that. And I actually see it somewhat in the, the forest planning regulations. Uh, so if you want to take a look and see how the federal BLM planning could be affected, mm -hmm. take a look and see what's going on in the forest right now. Okay, so in, in the break you were trying to explain this to me a little bit. Um, what is the hang up with the, with the forest planning that's, that's taking place right now from your perspective at a county level? They're giving the counties and the conservation districts an opportunity to comment, but basically they're giving us a five day window to make comments on anything they throw out there before they give it to the public. Now the problem with this is, is it's pretty hard to get together comments that really outlines what the, the county needs mm -hmm. Or our watershed, as far as it goes, because that's what this, you know, con you know, consists of. <coughs> excuse me, consists of here in in Carbon and Emory County. Right. But the thing about it is, is if they if they don't take a look at our comments in enough time that they can change or amend the stuff they're given to the public, it really hurts the public and it hurts us in our ability to create a, a range of alternatives. Okay, so let's let, let's try and define this out then. Um, basically, a planning process comes up with five alternatives. There, there's some change, a lot of change, no change, and something in between. They pick one that they think is a preferred alternative. And, and, and that's what's usually presented to the public at the first scope. And you're saying before they get to those alternatives, they give you five days uh, to comment, and then no time before it goes public to make any changes to those alternatives? That's what I'm saying, yeah, and that's a real problem. It should be the Forest Service coming in, taking our comments, and, and putting them together with what the forest says so that they, the range of alternatives can be more concise to both the forest service needs and for the area. So basically you're saying that all the alternatives are basically what the forest planners that work for the forest service, it's their perspective. At this point in time, that's what I see. How do you fix it? Make them do, the, do it the right way, the way that was intended. Okay, well, okay, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. So. Um, uh, what's the last piece of advice you would have to whoever takes your place? Use your county plans. I've worked a long time to do that and to get them done. They need to be taken care of, uh, you know, and sometimes amended, but I think we got a good basis for what the people need here. They was approved through public hearing and uh, I, I think they, they need to be used. So is that, is that um, get it in writing and get it in the public eye is the, is the mantra for county plans? Yes, and know what, what you've got. All right, very good. Rex, thank you for taking the time. Thank you. I'm sure there are a lot of people around the state that will miss you. Thank you for uh, inviting us into your home on the county seat. We'll look for you next week on the county seat.